Welcome to the headlines. I'm Wendy Chen. Thank you for joining us. Coming up in today's top stories, city volunteers in southern Taiwan tend to those affected by a gas explosion in Xinyuan Township of Pindong County. In today's feature report on products made in Taiwan, we visit Zhanghua's Zetou Township to witness the transformation of a traditional industry. And in Indonesia, city volunteers regularly visit a local nursing home to hold free clinics and provide haircut and nail trimming services. First up in Taiwan, in Pingdong Xinyuan Township, a gas explosion occurred in a residential building at around 6 p.m. on March 18. The owner of the house, Mr. Wu, suffered second to third degree burns to 40 percent of his body and is still in the intensive care unit at the Kaohsiung Armed Forces General Hospital. Upon learning of the news, city volunteers arrived to comfort his family members. <laughs> Outside the intensive care unit, Mr. Wu's mother talks to the volunteers of her son's condition. Volunteers not only lend in year, but also pass on their well wishes. We provided emergency cash, but the mother said they don't need it. We will continue to follow up with this family. Lying in the ICU of the Kaohsiung Armed Forces General Hospital is Mr. Wu from Pindong Xingyuan who was severely injured in a gas explosion and suffered burns to his head, hands as well as part of his body. City Volunteers Company gives his mother the strength to go on. Volunteers also did not forget to care for neighbors around the disaster site in Pindong. We need to first find out the current situation and how it happened and then care for those influenced by the accident. City volunteers in both Pingdong and Kaohsiung work together to help those affected families to overcome this difficult time. To help students from impoverished families pursue their studies, city volunteers arrived at the Guangzhou University of Chinese Medicine to hand out scholarships. Meanwhile, volunteers also visited the homes of students from Qingyuan First Middle School to better understand their living conditions. In Guangzhou, China, city volunteers drive scholarships recipients as they carry out home visitations. Zhu Cui Yi lives in a plain and simple house, but her family is content with what they have, and her mother is proud of her thoughtful kids. When Cui Yi comes back, she always helps me doing farm work, for example, planting rice seedlings. To help develop Cui Yi's responsibility and thoughtfulness, her mother says that she tries to make herself an example for her children. In Wei Ting's home, we meet her grandparents who have to look after six grandchildren. <laughs> Wei Ting tries her best to shoulder her grandparents' burden when she is home, as her sons are all working outside the village. Despite the difficulties in life, thankfully, the children are always thoughtful enough to help out. Here at the Guangzhou University of Chinese Medicine, city volunteers organize a scholarship ceremony for students in need. Other than handing out scholarship aid, volunteers also introduce Dean's aphorisms to inspire the students. I am very touched by Tsuji Jin's aphorisms, which teaches us that any trivial or ordinary things in life can be inspiring and moving. Tsuji's scholarship aid not only helps these students, but also gives them the strength to move forward with their dreams. Staying in China each day at Xiamen's Ma Xiang Junior High School, 80 percent of the students does not finish the food on their plate. Seeing this, the principal invited city volunteers to spread the message of eating 80 percent full and saving the remaining 20 percent for those in need. In Xiamen, China, an assembly was called for the children to head to the cafeteria as this assembly was related to food. It is hard to estimate how much each child eats, but we mostly overestimate the amount. In the end, the children just toss out the leftovers. About 80 percent of them have food left over. The school principal invited city volunteers to teach the students of Ma Xiang Junior High the importance of not wasting food, as the food they toss away could have been food for the starving children in Africa. 
we should save some food for poor people to eat. Knowing the concept of zero leftovers is not the same as actualizing zero leftovers. So Tsuji volunteers return to the school the next day to check up on the students. Yes, after watching the videos yesterday, I think that we should all save some food for those who don't have enough to eat to help them. Before the kitchen waste was about two buckets, and today there's not even enough to fill one bucket. From these results, it's evident that these students have learned a lesson they will never forget. Today in our series of feature reports on the blueprints for MIT, we visit the homeland of Taiwan's stock industry in Seto Township of Zhanghua County to see how this traditional industry has been transformed by the introduction of newer technologies and designs into production lines. For making a pair of stockings from start to finish, the process will at least go through 10 different people. In Shetou Township, which accounts for 80 percent of Taiwan's sock production, a third of the production here makes a living working in the sock industry. However, facing increases in the cost of labor and raw materials, how has this traditional industry managed to survive? Taiwan Shetou Township of Zhanghua County is nicknamed the homeland of socks as the area produces more than 400 million pairs of socks a year. Instead of big factories, most of the socks are made in small-scale workshops that are found throughout the township, and each step of the process from sewing to packaging is done by hand. Yet in today's market, simply producing normal socks is just not enough to survive. The need for regular socks has gone down by 20 to 30 percent, and this is a big problem for the stock industry. To increase sales, we have invented value-added socks. For example, nano bamboo socks and the copper fiber socks. Instead of grieving for the losses in profit, companies have begun researching ways to incorporate new technologies into their products. Taiwan's sock industry also works hand in hand with the Industrial Technology Research Institute to create socks that are not only functional but also stylish. This is a pair of mosquito-proof stocking, and we are the first to have come up with this product. It is good for preventing bites from the mosquitoes that are seen throughout Taiwan. The original price of a pair of socks is probably worth around two dollars, but when we add new functions, the selling price can increase by as much as 50 to 100 percent. Thanks to the introduction of new technology, Taiwan's traditional sock industry has been slowly transformed. It now produces a whole range of different socks, such as ones that are antibacterial, UV-resistant, heat-resistant and breathable. To earn a profit, the most important thing is to create products that satisfy consumers' needs. We are inventing products that are beyond the consumer's imagination, so they have a huge variety of items to choose from. Although Taiwan's sock industry does not have the large economy of scale that corporations do, but these small factories can respond to the market's needs faster than big corporations. In this factory, students from design schools first come up with new designs. Next, the designs are made into samples, and upon approval, these will then be mass-produced. Furthermore, the Industrial Technology Research Institute even sets up an office in Shetou Township to help with the expansion of the sock industry. With the help of technology and new designs, we hope to differentiate Taiwan's socks from those imported. We want to make it clear that from start to finish, these products are all made in Taiwan. By combining technology and outstanding design, these high-quality MIT socks would definitely be the first choice for many consumers. 
as the Malaysia City chapter is working towards the construction of its education centre and dialysis centre, the Building Council Committee from Taiwan once again visited the site on March 18th with suggestions to ensure the new centres will be able to fulfil their role as a spiritual and environmental refuge. Construction of the Tsuji Education Center and Dialysis Center here in Malaysia started in 2012, with members of the Tsuji Construction Committee periodically traveling from Taiwan to oversee and guide the construction process. They have already finished 95.5 percent and the remaining 3 to 5 percent, whether it is the education center, the Jin Si Ho, or the dialysis center. We are here to offer some technical advice and assistance. The Tsuji Malaysia chapter was founded in 1993 and in the following two decades has worked to accurately reflect Master Zhenyan's teachings and practice. So too with the building of the education center and dialysis center in which the suggestions of the Taiwan Tsuji Building Committee were invaluable for local architects and construction crews. This medical center has lots of regulations that need to be followed. With their experience and advice, we were able to make some improvements. Our goal is more utility at best host, as well as the biggest operations possible with the longest lifespan. As centers for spiritual fulfillment and social work, all city buildings must reflect the qualities of safety, sturdiness, and eco-friendliness. When people get sick, they see a doctor. But what about plants? In Xinzhu, Taiwan, a well-known plant hospital was established in the local community. Within, plant doctors not only help local residents heal their sick plants, but also take in unwanted and abandoned plants and nurture them back to life. <laughs> there doesn't appear to be any serious problems. Your plant isn't getting enough water because your pot is too small. All you need to do is replant it in a new pot and trim off the decayed parts and it will be fine. <laughs> Hidden in the alleys of the Xinzhu Science Park is a hospital for flowers, plants and trees. Apart from helping community members solve their problems with their plants, the hospital also shelters abandoned or unwanted plants. Plants are also living organisms. It would be a pity just to discard them. Why not nurture them and give them a new life? So based on this, we decided to establish a plant hospital to take in unwanted orchids, foliage, plants and the trees. Learning of the hospital service, community members have started bringing plants which they no longer need to the hospital. Plants which were given as gifts and are no longer needed or which belong to relocating home owners are all brought here. We often receive big parted or kids. However, many of the plants brought in are infected, often due to neglect. In order to extend their life cycle, plenty needs to be done. This orchid was sold in the shop that did not cultivate in its proper habitat. So we are going to replant it in a more suitable and appropriate environment. With the changing of pots, trimming, replanting, some watering and nurturing, the dying orchid is soon revived. The backbone of the plant hospital not only includes gifted healer Zheng Yuling, but also volunteers and seniors who foster these plants as their own family. To date, volunteers have successfully revived some 600 discarded plants, transforming the hospital into a place filled with vitality. This place is filled with life and energy. Seeing a place surrounded by trees, plants and flowers is rather comforting. Under the attentive care of the volunteers, once these plants have been nurtured back to full health, they are discharged and help beautify every corner of the community.
也是希望能够就是能够。We hope that our alleys and lanes can be transformed into more environmentally friendly surroundings. This is our ultimate goal. 都是能够绿美化的。With a touch of creativity, volunteers combine recycling and greenery to add charm to their community. A palm tree planted in a recycled pot and an orchid nested in a pair of working gloves injects freshness and vitality to street corners. The soil used to plant azalea flowers is made from kitchen waste. We use leftover fruit and vegetable peels as natural fertilizer. Over time, we found that our azalea flowers blossomed very beautifully. By synchronizing elements of nature into the community, the Plant Hospital has created a community full of life and vitality. City volunteers regularly visit the Caritas nursing home every two months to care for the elderly residents there. Besides holding free clinics, volunteers will also give the seniors a haircut and trim their nails. When city volunteers come visiting, the elderly residents here at Caritas nursing home are always glad to see them. I don't think about anything else. I enjoy listening to the volunteers singing. I don't mind that my children are not by my side. Although living at the home is not without its moments of loneliness, Tsuji volunteers try to bring a bit of warmth by holding free clinics and care for the elderly, like their family members. Volunteers often feel caring for the elderly is just like caring for a child. Memang ada oma kadang-kadang dia lagi Sometimes when the seniors are not feeling well and we need to cut their hair, we will have to pacify their emotions. Upon each visit, Tsuji volunteers give the residents a haircut and trim their nails, leaving the seniors with a refreshed mind and appearance. They will come cut my hair for me. I look forward to it very much. Just like family members parting ways, everyone looks forward to the next time they meet. Back to Taiwan in Taoyuan Xintai District, the city parents and child class went on a field trip to a nursing home for children with special needs. By taking these students outdoor for a sunbath and feeding them delicious desserts, volunteers managed to put a smile on each of their faces. <laughs> Students from the Tsuji parent and child class are encountering children with special needs for the first time. Under the guidance of Tsuji volunteers, the students are making friends and extending a helping hand. What I'm most thankful for today is I never thought my child was very detail-oriented. I've always thought he was a bit careless in his ways. However, when he was feeding the children pudding today, he was very careful and kind as he feed them spoon by spoon. Since it's a nice day out, everyone heads outside for a walk. Such simple activities enlist laughter from the residents. Who knew happiness was this easily achieved? We have to extend our hands to help others, but it was always just words being said. Today my child personally experienced what it's like to help others, and I saw how he initiated giving to others. It's evident he has heard what we have been saying, and I'm really grateful for that. The home holds a charity sale with items all handmade by residents. And at the end of the day, everyone takes home a little souvenir as a token of the time they had together today. Moving to Taipei in Xindian District, the Sunshine Social Welfare Foundation Rehabilitation Center is a halfway house for burn victims to carry out rehabilitative therapy. As part of their care for these victims, city volunteers pay regular visits to encourage them through their recovery. <laughs> We can't accept people's bad words just because they say they weren't deliberate. That's not right either. 
Reminding the burn victims to forgive people's unintentional mistakes is Ciji volunteer Dai Yuyuan, who and other volunteers bring joy to the burn victims here at the Sunshine Rehabilitation Center. These burn victims' appearances have been disfigured, which may frighten people who don't know them. Although their appearances may be damaged, their hearts are still healthy. Conversely, there are many people out there, despite having beautiful appearances, they have problems within. A 77-year-old grandma joins the volunteers singing. Later, volunteers hand out colorful balloons for everyone to play with, and their laughter lights up the room. The courage really impresses me. Every day when they wake up, they have to keep fighting in order to leave the Sunshine Center one day and embrace a new life. Thanks to the regular visits of city volunteers, these burn victims are ready to continue the process of physical and psychological recovery. In Texas of the United States, at a volunteer training seminar, Wang Mingyan, who is in charge of the medical mission at the Tsiji Dallas chapter, shared with fellow volunteers the honorable role of a silence mentor. New York Tsiji volunteer Luo Liu Guizhen, who was devoted to Tsiji for the past 23 years, donated her organ to help save lives and also her body to advance medical science when she passed away in February this year. Her motto in life was, it's a blessing to be able to give and it would be a waste to do nothing in life. I would rather have doctors make a mistake on my body than that of a patient. At the Tsiji Dallas chapter in Texas, Wang Mingyan, who is in charge of the mission of medicine, shares stories of silent mentors with 60 Tsichens and commissioners. Through pictures and stories, audience members realize anyone can contribute to the medical mission. Tsiji volunteers are not the only ones preserving wisdom. Newly joined volunteers are also seeking to gain wisdom at their introductory lesson of Tsiji's four missions. In fact, the fundamentals of religions are the same. It is the cultivation of oneself by walking the righteous path and doing what one is set out to do. Like the Jinx aphorism says, we do not have ownership of our life, only the privilege of using it. In facing life or death, we should do our part in contributing to better our society. Back to Indonesia at the end of the show, at the Pantai Inda Kapuk Tsiji Elementary School in North Jakarta, to help students learn the meaning behind filial piety, teachers invited their parents to school and asked students to give them a massage and hand therapy. We'll leave you with these images. Thank you for tuning in. Goodbye.